Thank you very much. I think everything's on. I've got like 19 microphones. <laughs> the Scholars Program, that sounds pretty cool. I never, ever have given a presentation where anybody got any credit for it. So um, th that's kind of neat, too. Um, this, is, this is especially fun for me. I'm a, um, a 1980 graduate of NC State in computer science. So I got a BS in computer science. Yeah! Woo! Okay, so, um, and it's absolutely amazing that I ever accomplished that. I, I entered it in 1976. I was a freshman and I came down to NC State to play soccer. And then, and so I played soccer for NC State and then along about my junior year I said, oh man, I better do something about an education. And then the last two years, were an absolute blur, absolute blur. I had cash coming out of my pockets, my professors were making money, but I got out. And it was, and I never thought that I would have the opportunity to come back here and speak, so this is an absolute honor to do so. I've had a, uh, an interesting career to date. When I left um, NC State, I was a software developer for a small company that um, did uh, uh, customer service systems for newspapers around the country. And uh, I worked at the News and Observer, I worked at the Globe and Mail in Toronto, uh, Orange County Register in Santa Ana. And I had a really good time uh, until the company went under. And then I had an opportunity to go to work for the News and Observer, so that kept me here. Uh, so I stayed in Raleigh for another eight years, ran their IT operation, uh, went on to uh, be the general manager of Business North Carolina Magazine in Charlotte, did that for a couple of years, that was fun. Uh, then came back and uh, became uh, head of IT operations for a company called ISA out in the park. Enjoyed that, and then very quickly realized that the people that seemed to be having all the fun were the ones that were trying to sell me something. So I said, you know, I've, I've heard about this company, SAS. I think I'm going to make a career change. And I actually came to SAS in 1994 in a position that was called a systems engineer. It was a sales support position where I would go out with salespeople and, and provide the technology support role. And uh, that turned into many things over time, uh, and I ended up with this job. Um, which I've had for six or seven years probably, and, and I've absolutely enjoyed it. It's, it's the marriage that I've been looking for uh, in my entire career, which is I get, to be, I get to exercise what I know about technology, and I get to position it uh, and talk about it in the marketplace. And I absolutely, absolutely love that. And I found the perfect company to do that with, which is SAS. Um, our founder, uh, Jim Goodnight, and our other founder, John Saul, are both extremely involved in the business. And I'm convinced that it, to, in today's, today's marketing world, that if you don't know what you're talking about, you're not going to survive. And that is particularly true at SAS. There's no way that a, a, a pure marketing person is going to come in and survive that job. They're going to have to understand the technology. So that's a little bit about me. That's a little bit about me. SAS, SAS we find ourselves in a really, really good spot. Business analytics, business intelligence was mentioned. Um, we are in the hottest software space out there today. It is relatively immune to economic downturn if positioned correctly uh, with the customer uh, because there, it is a value-based opportunity for customers. We don't sell technology. We sell solutions to very difficult business problems. And we've evolved to that point um, over the last 32, 33 years. And I'll talk about that um, just a little bit. We have a track record um, that, that is unmatched in the software industry. You can go back to Roman times. There were no software companies back then. <laughs> it's late. All right, you can go back. You can, look at, I mean, you can look at Oracle. You can look at Microsoft. You can look at SAP. You can look at any of these guys. And they don't have what we've got in terms of revenue growth every single year since we were founded in 1976. We've been profitable every single year since we were founded in 1976 and we have never taken a dime of outside money. There is no debt in the organization and probably clo close to a billion dollars in cash at this point. So we sit in a really, really good position. We sit in a position whereby we can call our own shots. The people who founded the company run the company. They understand technology. They invest heavily into research and development. That's what this blue bar represents, somewhere around 20 to 25 percent on an annual basis of top line revenue goes back into research and development. That's innovation. If you look at public companies, mature public software companies, you're going to see reinvestment somewhere around 10 to 12 percent. So the folks who work in research and development at SAS are very fortunate in terms of the funding that they receive. I'm also very happy that we are a privately held company. 
I'm a firm believer that the marriage of Wall Street and software companies is terrible. It's absolutely terrible. Wall Street is a model from the 1980s as far as software companies are, are concerned. They expect innovation on a quarterly basis. They are still looking for that next spreadsheet, the next word processor, that next release of Windows on a quarterly basis. That's not what our business is about any longer. We have got to be able to invest in innovation and we have got to be able to invest for the long haul. Wall Street does not allow software companies to do that. That's one of the reasons, I believe, that you see all the hype and all the FUD out there around software companies. They've got to keep their share price up. They've got to keep Wall Street happy. Hopefully we will never find ourselves in a position where we are going public and having to deal with the quarterly mentality. So we feel fortunate in that respect as well. The other area that we feel fortunate in is that 56%, more than half of our revenues on an annual basis, 2.2 billion last year, more than, more than half of those revenues come from outside the Americas. We are a well-balanced company in terms of where our customers are. There are 44,000 customers around the world and they're spread out. At any given point in time, somebody is having an economic issue or a geopolitical issue and that's okay because there's some other part of the world that's doing just fine. That is one way that we've been able to achieve this year-over-year -year growth every single year. So there's 44,000 customers around the world. There's about 10,000 employees, just over 10,000. About 4,000 of those are right here in North Carolina, in Cary, North Carolina, at our headquarters uh, just down the street. If we look at how we're split across industries, services, retail, you can see where our customers lie. Financial services, 42%. I've had a number of calls from the press in the last uh, week or so saying, oh my goodness, 42% of your revenue is in financial services. There's only two banks left in the world. You know, are you worried? Are you worried? And the answer is no. Quite honestly, this area is thriving for us, even in this current economy. And I'll talk a bit about that. And it's because we are not selling technology. We are selling solutions today to really tough business problems. So what do I mean by that? We're not selling databases, we're not selling analytic tools, we're not selling report writers. We're using those technologies and we're put, piecing them together to sell things like credit risk, market risk, operational risk, fraud detection, price optimization. That's where the technology has gone. And I'll talk more about that as well. SaaS, how have we evolved to meet our customers' needs? And, and I'm going to show you this because I think it reflects how the market has changed in the last 30 years as well. So founded in 1976, a couple of guys out of NC State, and they come up with a number of great tools, analytic tools, products. So they come up with access engines that allow people to get data out of, out of complex operational data environments. They provide analytic tools that allow people to analyze that data like no one has ever analyzed it before. And they come up with presentation layer tools that allow people to present that information. Fantastic. That worked really well. Until about 1995 and the future of the software industry, we determined at that point, was not going to be in tools and products. It was going to be in solving business problems. So in 1995, we entered the second phase of our evolution, horizontal solutions. What do I mean by horizontal solutions? Horizontal meaning cutting across industry. Solutions like customer relationship management, human capital management, financial consolidation and reporting, operational risk, IT performance management, things that cut across all industries. That's worked really well. And then around 2000, during the dot bomb revolution, we determined we're gonna need an even re uh, more refined, refined value proposition in the marketplace. So we entered the third phase, vertical solutions. We underestimated what the effort was going to be here. This is all about understanding issues specific to particular industries. Not just from a sales and a marketing perspective, but from an R&D perspective, from an education perspective, a tech support perspective, a professional services perspective. So now we're dealing with solutions in banking, in telecommunications, in retail, in government, and it works, it works, it works. So if we look back, it's all the same technology under the covers we just put industry domain wrappers around it. And there's a lot more value to it in that respect. Example, one of the biggest problems in the wireless industry today, in the handset industry today, 
is churn, churning of customers. You sign up with AT&T, and the moment you sign up with AT&T, someone from Verizon is trying to steal you. It, it's a big problem that costs these carriers 10, 20, 30, 100 million dollars a year. All right, how long have they been dealing with it? Forever. So back here, if they were trying to deal with that solution, they would have bought an access product for, from us, some analytics, and some presentation layer stuff, some report writing stuff, and they might have spent $150,000. They would have built it themselves. Same stuff, packaged as a horizontal solution, we call it customer relationship management, so they can handle this churn for telco, telco solution. 150,000 on the top line, now it costs $500,000. Why? Because it says CRM. It says CRM. This is where you marry marketing and technology expertise, all right? So then you say, all right, tools, CRM, hmm. Let's sell a churn for telco solution. Same stuff, a little bit of an industry wrapper around it, a little bit more going on. $150,000, $500,000, $3 million. And you know what? It works. It absolutely works. And it's not like we're taking money from people. We walk in and we say that you have a $50 million problem in your organization, which is churn. How about if we reduce that by 20% in the first year? Oh, my gosh, the uh, solution is going to pay for itself in the first six months. So you know what? I will give you $3 million today if you'll give me $20 million. And that's what it's all about. It's about approaching this, the, the, this business world from a business issue perspective and then recognizing that technology can solve those issues. As opposed to walking in and saying, I've got a CRM package here with all these data access engines and all these analytic routines and modeling capability and I can show that stuff to you on the web. It's not going to work. It's not going to work anymore. People are not going to buy that. Or you're going to get yourself in a feature and function war um, that you'll never win. Never win. I love this quote from Peter Drucker. Every organization needs one core competence, and that's innovation. So I want to talk a little bit about some of the things that we're seeing in the marketplace. This is probably more important than ever. Innovation. Everybody's talking about it. Everybody says they're doing it, but what does it mean? Why is innovation so important today? I know at SaaS, I know at the, uh, when we talk to customers and prospects and partners, we're all facing the same thing. If our eyes are open, we realize that the way in which we have done business for the last 30 years is not, let me repeat, it is not what is going to make us successful in the next five. If we think that what we've done for the last 30 years is going to push us forward, we're crazy. It will not work. It will not work. We have to change the way we're doing business. We have to change the speed at which we innovate. We've got to think outside the box, and this is especially true in mature markets. Emerging markets actually have an advantage today. Talk about that for just a minute. These numbers tell a story. 161, 281, 1800, 264, and 8090. These are from an IDC study that deal with data volumes. What are we talking about? 161 exabytes of data, of information, were captured and replicated in 2006. Now, this audience knows what that's all about. Most of them, you got to tell them, megabytes, gigabytes, terabytes, petabytes, exabytes, right? Exabytes. 161 exabytes of data were captured and replicated in 2006. 2007, 281 exabytes were captured. 2007 was an interesting year because in 2007, we captured and replicated 281 exabytes, but we only had 264 exabytes of storage available to us. So the amount of data that we were replicating, capturing, storing, or attempting to store was far exceeding the storage capacity. The way in which people have done business for the last 10 or 15 years had to change. What people used to do was capture every bit of data that would come across their doorstep, store those in disk volumes off somewhere, create what they would call a data warehouse. It wouldn't work, but they create it, and they would save all that information because they might need it one day. Well, that doesn't happen anymore. The rate at which information is being generated, it is not possible to capture it and keep it in a, in a quality form for decision, for decision making. So the challenge to organizations today, and why we're being so successful at SAS and our competitors are being so successful, because it's all about, today it's all about organizations establishing an intelligence platform whereby 
They can, they can create an environment where 99% of this data runs right past their heads, and only 1% is captured. And you've got to know what that 1% is, and that 1% is going to be the differentiator in terms of decision making out there in the markets. Let's look ahead. 1,800 exabytes captured and replicated in 2011. I find this really interesting. This is what IDC says. I'd love to meet the guy who had to count all this stuff. Can you imagine what they look like? So, uh, but who's going to dispute their figures? Now, there's one other number. If you go to the web and you look up this IDC study, it's about six months old. You can click this link and you can look at what your personal digital footprint is. So you see all this stuff out there and you go, well, how am I contributing to that? And, and, and it takes about 20 minutes and you answer questions like, do you have a cell phone? Do you, do you send text messages? Do you create PowerPoint presentations? Do you have a DVR? How much do you record a week? Um, you know, do you send pictures to people? So I fill out all that and I find out that Jim Davis produces 8,090 megabytes per day and that's my personal digital footprint. I have absolutely no idea what to do with that number um, or what use it, it serves. But it's kind of interesting and, and, I, and I tell folks that as important as green is and everything, somebody's going to eventually tie, the, tie this to some green or sustainability issue and we're all going to have to reduce our digital footprint. But so anyway, I just wasted three minutes. So now let's look, so if we, if we buy off on the fact that we all need to innovate, and let's, let's agree that one of the things that fuels innovation is information, and now we can agree that there's a tremendous amount of information out there, then we have to say, who's using it? Who's using it? There's a great book out there, a lot of you have probably seen by Thomas Friedman called The World is Flat. And that's created a whole market of people who want to say that's wrong, and they've written books about why he's wrong, so it's created a whole thing. But I think he's right in terms of the world is flat. There is fiber everywhere, and the ability to innovate is no longer confined to the mature markets around the world. In fact, I would argue that the mature markets of the U.S., Western Europe, and parts of Asia Pacific are in trouble because the emerging markets, the emerging markets are hungry they have access to information. They have no pre preconceived notion as to how a business should be run, and they're just off and they're doing it. One way to look at it is to say, where are the internet users around the world? Is this true? All right, so last year we see we have about 500 million internet users in Asia, another 350 in Europe, 225 in North America, Latin America. It's kind of what you would expect, kind of what you would expect. Now let's look at where the growth has been for the last five or six years. Average world growth, Blue bar, 286%. North America is at the bottom. It's grown 120%. Australia, not too well. Europe, 231. You got Middle East at 920% at the top. Africa's there at 820, 830%. Latin America, Asia. The playing field is becoming level. It is becoming level. So our ability within organizations to deal with large amounts of data, make sense of it, and use it in support of fact-based decisioning is probably going to help us determine whether we, whether we thrive, whether we survive, whether we fail in the next few years. And I don't mean the next 10 years, I mean the next three to five. So those of you that are, that are in school here and are dealing with this, you're in a very, very good position in terms of helping organizations deal with this information. I can also tell you, based on my own experience, globally, there is an enormous shortage of people who understand how to deal with this data and how to deal with this information. This came out from Accenture not long ago. They asked about 1,000 managers in Europe and, and, and America, and they said, how well are you using information today in support of decision making? Interesting responses. 42% said there's too much information. That's the wrong answer. The right answer is there's wonderful information out there, there's lots of it, and I know what to do with it, and I use it every single day in support of decision making. I make decisions based on facts. But you can see half of them don't do that. There are political issues. 44% of departments aren't forthcoming with their data. There are quality issues. Is it current? Is it, du is it duplicated? What value does it have? Now, there's two statistics up here that aren't up here that were part of the study. Only 16% of executives, only 16% of executives said that they share their data in a collaborative environment. So there's a lot of important stuff locked up on people's desktops that could help organizations, but for whatever reason, it's not being shared. 
The other really interesting statistic here is that 46%, almost half, responded and said, we realize after the fact that we have made a decision, a business decision, based on bad data on a weekly basis. Imagine if that's the transportation industry or the healthcare issue uh, industry or something along those lines. That's devastating, absolutely devastating. So we buy off on the fact that there's a problem out there. Number one priority for chief information officers out there today, number one priority is to establish this thing out there today called the information value chain. Information value chain. We see this no matter where we go whether we're in China, whether we're in Russia, whether we're in the Czech Republic, whether we're in the US, Mexico, they're all talking about the same thing. How do we create a more cohesive environment, computing environment? What I've had historically in mature markets is operational systems over here, ERP systems, you know, the SAPs, the Oracles, the homegrown systems that deal with transaction processing, and then maybe some spotty decision support environments out in departments. What the CIO is charged with, and it is an enormous task, is to create an information value chain whereby a transaction comes in the operational environment, is processed, and then immediately gets passed off to the other important environments. The decision support environment has been neglected. It's been a hobby. But I'm here to tell you that today it is probably one of the most essential areas that organizations must invest in. Think about it. The operational platforms, we talked about those, the ERP systems. We spend tens of millions of dollars of those, uh, on those systems in our organization. But I challenge anyone in this room or anyone out there to tell me what the return on that investment is. There is none. It's plumbing. It's the plumbing necessary to run the organization. You've got to spend the money. You're not going to see a return. Productivity platforms, Microsoft Outlook, Excel, Word, Internet Explorer, SharePoint, those things we all have on our desktops. Why do we have them? Because we have to. We have to. But is there a return? No, nope. no return on that investment. Or if there is, it's very difficult to determine what it is. What about this idea of an intelligence platform? Well, people have bought BI tools in departments over the years, but they haven't, they haven't put it together. There is no cohesive platform across the organization to give you a consistent view of a customer, of a supplier, of a financial metric, of a market. And this is where people are focusing today. And this is quite honestly why we are seeing such great success in the marketplace. Spend the money on operational platforms, sure. Spend the money on productivity platforms, sure. The intelligence platform, yeah, we better catch up. This is where we're going to capture all the data. This is where we are going to apply high-end analytics to that data. This is where we are going to predict future trends in our business so we become more proactive in our decision making. A word about analytics. Analytics is part of that intelligence platform. This is something that is obviously very, very near and dear to SAS's heart. This is what we were founded on. Analytics used to be something that was kind of reserved for some strange individuals that worked in the back room. Analytics is in the forefront of business today. It's talked about in the boardrooms. Analytics is the most used and abused term in the market today. Everybody says they have it. But do they? Now the answer is yes, they do. But we need to talk about how to define analytics in the marketplace. We need to define analytics based on the questions we are answering. We need to define analytics based on a spectrum of capability from simple summary statistics all the way up to high-end predictive modeling and optimization. So if you look at some of these questions, standard reports help us answer questions like what happened? So I get a financial report at the end of the month. How many things did I sell? How much money did I spend? What's my bottom line look like? Ad hoc reports. I need to know something a little bit different off the standard report. I need a report writer. How many, how often, where? Query drill down. OLAP. Those of you that are familiar with OLAP, define dimensions. Where exactly is the problem? Show me how many sales I made in this particular region of this particular product in this particular time frame. So I'm crossing these, these dimensions. Alerts. Did I exceed a threshold? What actions are needed? Everybody pretty much offers these in their software packages today. What about these other questions? Why is this happening? Statistical analysis. Forecasting. What if these trends continue? What's going to happen to my business? Predictive modeling. What will happen next? Accumulate the data. Create models. Apply those models to the data. 
and you can see which customers are most likely to churn if you're a telecommunications company. You can see those customers that are most likely to commit fraud if you're in financial services. You can begin to optimize, if you look, what's the best can happen? You can begin to optimize prices in retail. Our fastest growing industry that we're servicing today is retail. Markdown optimization, price optimization, size and color optimization, assortment planning. There's a science behind what products go on what shelf, what level, what are above eyesight, what are below eyesight, what's adjacent. Analytics play a big part in that. Now, what's, what's the difference in these? These four right here. We're looking at data and we're telling ourselves what happened in the past. We are supporting reactive decision making. That's not going to cut it in the markets that we are dealing with today. How about these? Proactive decision making. We're predicting future aspects of our business in such a way that we can put plans in place that allow us to be proactive and avoid certain scenarios based on what is likely to happen. Analytics are incredibly powerful when it comes to running businesses. Incredibly powerful. If you can do that, oh, I, it was pretty neat when we did that in PowerPoint. Um, when we first did that, uh, at the end of the presentation, everybody, you know, all these people are coming up. I thought they liked my presentation. They want to know, how did you do that? Um, that was a couple years ago. Okay, so the information value chain uh, can be uh, an absolutely incredible asset, obviously, for the organization, particularly this concept of the intelligence platform. It was mentioned in the intro that um, I authored a book called The Information Revolution. And the idea behind the information revolution was to talk about how much data is out there in the world, what people are doing with it, and probably more important was to help organizations realize um, and assess their capability uh, to deal with the data and to deal with fact-based decisioning. It's gone over quite well. It's a conceptual model. Um, it, it's completely, it's vendor neutral. There's no mention of SaaS in it. There's no mention of any hardware vendors, any other software vendors. The idea behind this, this model, think of it as looking in the mirror if you're a company and, and, and discovering what sort of shape you're in in support of fact-based decisioning. So if we buy off on the fact that there's a tremendous amount of data out there, if we buy off on the fact that the markets are evolving at rates like we've never seen before, if we agree that we need to change the way in which we do business and that data can play a role in that, then we need to take a step back and say, are we ready? Are we ready? So we go through this model. There are five levels to it. Level one, two, three, four, five. Level one is the lowest. Level five is the highest. And we talk to large audiences and we say, let's go through it. And we won't ask you, but a light bulb is going to go on at some point as we're talking through this model and you're going to be able to identify where you are. So let's look at the model very quickly. If you're a level one organization, so if you're a level one organization, you are dominated by individuals. There really, there's no rhyme or reason to the way in which data is used. It's not used consistently. People aren't agreeing on data definitions. There's no common set of tools and platforms available. We just got a lot of people out there doing their own thing. We call this the level that's dominated by the information maverick. Right? We all have seen these people before. If you go into a company, you'll, you'll, you'll notice them. Their, their PCs tend to be a little bit bigger than ours. Size matters a lot to them, right? Um, their offices are two to three degrees warmer. Um, you see them on a Tuesday. You come back on a Wednesday and you do one of these. I swear that's what they were wearing yesterday, right? And what they're doing is they're sitting in their offices. They've accumulated tools. They're going after corporate data. They're making all sorts of joins. They're assuming what, what the business metadata is, what the relationships are. And then they come out. They come out every two or three days out of that office and they wave a fancy report and they go, aha, look what I have discovered. The scary thing is there's a bunch of people in that office who go, we need to make a business decision based on that. And that's dangerous. That is incredibly dangerous. Fortunately, most organizations are not at level one. There's nothing wrong with information mavericks as long as you have a few of them. They're actually good for the organization. They help the organization think about what is possible. What is possible with data? You just don't want the organization run by these people. If you're a level two organization, you have standardized on the data that you're going to use to support decision making. You have standardized on the tools you're going to use. You have standardized on what decisions are going to be supported by the data. 
So good standardization at the departmental level. This is the classic definition of business intelligence. The this classic definition of business intelligence was about creating some level of autonomy out in the user department, creating independence from IT. Why? Because what was happening was the sales department would say, I need a report that shows me what these salespeople are doing around this particular product. And the IT director would go, hmm, the IT steering committee meets in two months. We will put that on the agenda and we will address your need for that report. And then the steering committee would meet and they go, good news, we're going to do that report from you. You'll have it in eight months. And that was like 10, 15 years ago and people said, forget it. So people like SAS and Cognos and Business Objects and Hyperion came out with easy to use tools that allowed these users to create some level of independence away from IT. Go after the data themselves. Not bad. However, in today's market, this is not enough. If you are a bank, if you're one of the remaining banks, what is the value of a customer to you? It's not what they're doing in the mortgage area. It's not what they're doing in the credit card area. It's not what they're doing over in some other ATM area of the bank, right? The value of the customer is what they're doing across all those departments. So, so this departmental approach just doesn't work any longer. We have exhausted departmental differentiation in our industries. We have to begin to look enterprise-wide. And that's where we go when we're level three. If you're a level three organization, you have begun to integrate data across departments, bringing data together across departments and divisions. This is a tough, tough level to reach. Politics come into play. Information is power. Some people don't want to share, believe it or not. But if you can reach level three, some amazing things start to happen. You begin to see those things that you do really, really well as a company, and you begin to see a lot of those things that need improvement. You haven't done anything about it at this point, but you have put, laid the groundwork and you're, you have a whole new lens into your enterprise. This is the tipping point of the model. That can lead you directly into level four, which is probably one of the most popular areas today. It is at SAS and it is with our customers. If you're a level four organization, you have brought the data together from across departments and you're focusing in on those activities that need to be improved. You're optimizing prices. You're reducing fraud. You're doing, dealing with credit risk. All these things that have to do with the bottom line. You are optimizing the bottom line of the organization. Very, very powerful. Something that is incredibly important uh, to our customers and our prospects today, regardless of the economy. There is enormous cost savings here. It's probably the number one reason that we'll see double-digit growth this year at SAS. So regardless of what you hear, what's going on in the economy, this one is going gonna, is gonna to push us ahead. Level five, the level of innovation. Where level four, we looked at what we could do to the bottom line. Level five, we, were, we are using data in support of top line, new revenue. Data at this level is completely respected in the organization. We are committed to fact-based decisioning. People say, I know. They don't say, I think, more often than not. And at this level, we realize that data is an asset that has, is as important to us as our buildings, as our employees, as our customers, as the products that we produce. Data is no longer a second-class citizen. It has a place at the table. Lots and lots of examples here. We actually deal, a good example here is we deal with a large financial institution in New York that's still there. And it, um, we've been dealing with them for quite some time. One of our largest customers. And at, every day at SAS, all their credit card transaction data comes down to a hosted environment at SAS. Now think about it. That's a lot of data. We have 70 terabytes of information. We have the last seven years of credit card data of, um, sitting, sitting at SAS. It's anonymized. Uh, so, that, so that we don't misuse it. And we do a lot of pre-processing from an analytical standpoint and make it available back to the modelers of this financial institution, both in New York and India. What do they do with it? Well, historically, what credit card data has been used for, capture the financial, the, the, the sales transaction, charge the, um, the merchant 3% of the transaction, uh, send a statement to the customer, hope they don't pay on time so you can charge them interest to make money. That's what the credit card business has been all about. Well, this company realized that they have a tremendous amount of transaction data that can be uh, valuable beyond just billing people. They started thinking, let's say that you're Hilton Hotels in New York. 
you have a customer that comes in, you know that what they spend at your hotel, but you don't know anything else. When they're in New York, they probably go to a, to a certain restaurant, a certain show, their lifestyle is a certain way in New York. All that data is in the credit card data. This bank realized, hey, we can turn that around and we can sell that information back to Hilton Hotels and say, here's some, some CRM-like activities, some programs that you can offer to your customers. We know what else they do in the city. Why don't you make these offers to them? They go, well, that's great. And the credit card company says, yeah, it's not free. You're going to have to pay me for that. So there's a great example of where data is an asset and generates um, new lines of revenue. Now, so we ask the audience, we all say to the audience, are you a level one, two, three, four, or five? Without a doubt, 70 to 80% of the audience says we are stuck, and we are stuck between two and three. We're stuck between two and three. We got stuff going pretty good at the department level, but we can't get people to cooperate to get to level three. Can't get them to do it. Politics come into play. It is difficult. It is very, very difficult. So you can get to level one or two just by buying technology, but you're not going to get to three, four, or five unless you address organizational issues. This is how we have had to change at SAS. This is what we as computer science professionals, as engineering professionals need to understand. It, the more we understand about business and the nuances of how businesses are run, the more successful we are going to be at establishing strong technology platforms that are going to make a difference. So let's say you're stuck. What's affecting you moving up? Great uh, uh, note from Gartner. Through 2009, overcoming the complex organizational dynamics and having the skills necessary to do that are what is going to make a difference. So let's look forward. So we ask people, all right, you're stuck between two or three. Let's look at four things that affect your ability to move up that model so you can better your competitors. Infrastructure, human capital, knowledge processes, and culture. Infrastructure, this is the one that traditionally people have focused in on. Hardware and software, do I have the hardware and software necessary to support this new computing platform? Um, if not, you know, maybe I'll just go to a budget meeting and I'll help the CIO get $20 million and they'll start a new project. There is a reason why the average life of a CIO globally is 23 months. They cannot solve this problem alone. There's only one other position that has a tenure less than 23 months, and that's the chief marketing officer. Um, okay, very true, actually. Uh, human capital, people, people. How well are you situated in your organization from a people perspective? Before you take on this project, before you take on this, this enormous undertaking of changing the way in which we use data, do you have the right people in your organization? Do you have people that are committed to fact-based decisioning? Do you have H HR processes in place that help you evaluate the skill sets? Okay, maybe you do. Do you have education programs in place to help advance the skill sets of those people? I don't know, maybe you do, maybe you don't. That, we'll give this company a four. Knowledge processes, okay. I got the hardware and software, I've got some pretty good people, and I have education processes in place. What about processes to promote what I'm doing? The way in which you change an organization to more of a fact-based decisioning cu culture is to promote successes. Promote successes. Tell people where the data is, tell them how it's been used, tell them some of the returns that uh, those departments have received uh, in terms of using the data in support of fact-based decisioning. Something that is becoming extremely popular here is the concept of a competency center. We have help desks for our operational systems. We have help desks for our productivity platforms like Word or Excel. But how many organizations out there have help desks in support of using data and, making, and, and, and creating models to look at things like customers and suppliers and, and financial metrics? Study done by Computer World says that, uh, uh, actually Gartner says that about 33% of organizations are doing it or are actively looking. Obvious benefits, increased user satisfaction, more accurate decisions, and it pays for itself. Decreased software co costs. You go into any large organization today, they are dealing with 50 different software vendors that overlap in departments. There's a lot of money being wasted. So these, these little help desks will pay for themselves quite quickly. Let me go back to the uh, financial services industry. One of the problems there might be fraud. Fraud might cost a, a particular financial um, organization 
$500 million a year, not unheard of. So you say, I need to fix that problem, but I don't have the people with the analytic talent available to me. I'm going to have to hire somebody. Okay, I need to hire an executive search firm. That's going to cost me money. It's going to take me three months. I'd go through that. I then find this person that I'm going to hire, and I find out I've got to pay him so much money because there's a shortage of them in the marketplace. So I go ahead and I, and, and I hire those people, and, and I bring them on board. And the day they come on board, I know that some other executive recruiter is trying to get them away from me. Boy, this, this is a painful proposition. So they come into my office, the new employee comes in, and I say, we've got a $500 million fraud problem. I need you to reduce that by 10%. I know you can do it. They go, fine. They go off for six months talking to people in the company saying, hey, what do you do? What tools do you have? What data is available to me? Have we ever done this before? What the competency center represents is a whole new way of dealing with things like this. It becomes a repository for best practices. You hire that fraud expert, they come in, they go to the competency center and they say, here's my problem. The competency center says, these are the things that we have done before. This is the value of the data in each one of these examples. And here are the tools available to you. And oh, by the way, after you're done with your project, you're required to come back and, and tell us what you used and, and what your results were. So these things are incredibly valuable over time. Uh, as a side, I mentioned, um, I, I mentioned the shortage of people with this advanced analytic talent. It's interesting, and a lot of you are aware of this, I, you know, what, what SAS has done to fund this advanced analytics degree um, here at NC State. Uh, th this one's going to be fun to watch. I, I, I am a firm believer that, that the graduates of that program, their starting salaries are going to far exceed that of MBAs. I, I'm, I'm convinced of that in talking with, with people in business, whether I'm talking to people in retail or financial services or healthcare or pharmaceuticals, I tell you, the demand is so high. Any of you that are in that program, congratulations. Um, don't go cheap. Okay. All right, so fi the final one is culture. So we know where we are from a hardware software standpoint, a people standpoint, a process standpoint. This is the single biggest barrier to advancing this stuff in an organization. This gets back to publicly traded markets. You get executives, senior managers who are so focused on quarterly returns, they can't see far enough ahead to actually innovate. So you have to ask yourself, is the culture one that is willing to accept change? And probably more importantly, is the culture one in which it goes out, looks for change, really wants it, and just grabs right onto it? Those are the organizations that are going to be truly successful. So you get a view of the organization and what's going to help you or prevent you move up that information evolution model. You haven't talked about vendors. You've, talk, you've looked in the mirror. You can get executives and managers in a room together and you can say, let's plot our course. Let's do a gap analysis. Let's put a plan in place. Let's begin to promote how we're going to advance the organization. The information revolution, what's next? And a lot of you are probably studying this or looking at this, but this is what businesses are dealing with today. The data explosion, what are its sources and how can organizations cope? It's unstructured data. Probably 95% of those exabytes that I was talking about are actually unstructured data. However, what businesses are doing today, 99% of the businesses are making decisions based just on structured data. Customer records, financial records. They haven't even begun to do th simple things like text mining. Some companies have. Uh, we find it in manufacturing. They do warranty analysis using text mining. We find it in healthcare fraud. They'll do text mining on that. We've dealt with a, a company out of Israel that looks at voice and looks at voice inflection in call centers based on how far a voice goes up or down can determine an event that needs to trigger a process. So there's a lot happening out there. And I think if we get back together in this room in three or four years, we'll say, remember when all we did was talk about uh, structured data in the business world. I think when we really open up what unstructured data can offer, there's going to be enormous opportunity on the decision-making front. Is BI outdated? Absolutely. The definition of business intelligence where you're creating independence from the standpoint of query and reporting, that's not the definition anymore. We need to be talking not about BI, but we need to be talking about BA, business analytics in a business analytics framework or a business analytics platform. BI is a component of that platform. There is a reason that Cognos was purchased by IBM. There is a reason that Business Objects was purchased by SAP. There is a reason that Hyperion was purchased by Oracle in the last 12 to 18 months. 
because those products were technology, and technology in that area has become commodity. There is no differentiation. Business analytics, hopefully by now you realize there's a lot of differentiation there. Is your organization ready for Generation Y? We talk about this all the time. It used to be when a lot of us went in to work for a company, we were going to make a career out of it. Generation Y, it's all about three to four years and out. Wow. Well, that's okay. But what we have to do is make sure that we have some knowledge capture processes in our organization. We don't want that knowledge walking out the door. This is well where the intelligence strategy comes into play as well. Let me switch gears here at the end for just a minute. I want to give you a view on, um, uh, from a leadership standpoint, how SaaS views the world and how we think companies should be run. We have an amazing culture at SaaS. We're constantly seen as one of the best places to work, not only in the U.S., but also around the world. We're, we're in the fortune list all the time. Uh, Jim Goodnight has created a culture over at SaaS that is incredible. It's a very flat organization, not a lot of hierarchy. People are people. They're not, they're not just cogs in a wheel. And, and, and that's what makes us tick. In our industry, in the software industry, the average turnover rate at a company is 22%. 22% of the employees churn on an annual basis. We're 4%. 4% on an annual basis with 10,000 employees. Why is that? It's because people believe they matter, and they do. Well, let's, let's talk about that for just a minute. Successful business components. There are three. Company, customer, and employee. A lot of this seems obvious. What's more important, though, are the relationships between these. The relationship between company and customer, employee and customer, employee and company. And various companies spend more time on some than the others. And that's where you're going to see results or not see results. From a company customer perspective, what we're doing at SAS, we get our customers involved. There are 44,000 customers at SAS. They don't buy our software, they license it. They have to pay us to, uh, the right to use that software on an annual basis. If we're not showing value to them, they're not going to renew. We have about a 98% renewal rate on, uh, rate on an annual basis. We have this interesting thing called the SASware ballot. I don't know how many software companies do that anymore. We have an extremely active user group where we ask them to tell us what do they need changed in the software. And at the annual users group, we disclose the results of that ballot and when we're going to deliver what it is that they want. User groups, events, newsletters, user experience. We involve our customers in the creation of our products, not only in interfaces, but we don't do any, we, we do no new solutions today unless we have a development partner. We don't invent stuff here in Cary. We go out and our customers tell us what they need and then we build it for them. That's a big change from being a technology provider to a solutions provider. We have a lot of our customers that write books. Uh, this one's a big one, sascommunity.org. We launched this about a year ago. We've had an annual users group meeting that brings in four or 5,000 people. Um, they, come to, they come, they present papers on how they're using SAS to solve business problems. But you know what? The world has changed. The annual conference is dying, not for us, but in general. It's the old way of doing business. Why do you have just an annual conference? You need to have interaction with your users on a 24 by 7 basis. SASCommunity.org represents that. This is kind of interesting when we first started this. There are a lot of people who were worried, saying, well, what if people say something bad about us? Well, that's a good thing, isn't it? Do you want to have your head in the sand, or do you want to listen to your customers? And they police themselves. So if you've got one bad apple out there, the rest of the community will tell them to shut up. But if you do have a problem, you'll know real quickly, because you have about 100 people who agree with them. And then as a company, we need to do something about it. Why wait till once a year for a users group meeting to find those things out? The customer-employee relationship. Obviously very important. We have over 400 offices around the world. We don't sell our software through a reseller channel. All our software is sold by employees. We have a direct channel. That's kind of unusual in our business. Sounds expensive, but it's not expensive if you think about what you want to do is retain your customers to get the, those renewal dollars on an annual basis. 
keep your churn rate of your employees low down to about 4% a year, they see the same, the customer seems, sees the same face year in and year out. There's a relationship there. And that relationship at a local level, we can not only determine whether the customer's happy or not, but we can also make sure that we are, we are solving their needs and evolving our products to meet their needs. So that works really well. The company employee one, that's the big one at SAS. That is the, the biggest one out there. How do we treat our employees? And how do we replicate that culture around the world? It's not easy. It's, not, it, it's pretty easy here in Cary because we have this beautiful campus. You know, we've got the, we've got the softball fields and the soccer fields and the he healthcare center. We've got the aerobics instructors. We've got this woman named Shantae that cuts hair. Uh, I don't, I, I've never met her. And then, um, you know, and, and all that kind of stuff. And they say, well, how can you spend all that money on your employees? Well, how can you afford not to? Uh, there's Jeffrey uh, uh, Pfeffer from uh, Stanford did a study on SAS not long ago where he looked at our low turnover rate and what that equates to in terms of savings. In today's dollars and today's numbers, it's probably about $125 million a year that we save. So can we afford to build a swimming pool? You're darn right we can because we keep the same employees. We don't deal with the churn. The teams stay intact. The quality of the software stays up there. The offices around the world, we spend a lot of money. Our office in Venice we own. This is an estate that we own. I think this might be in Sweden. I'm not sure. This is our research and development facility here in Cary. So we make sure that we provide an environment that is going to promote innovation. 24% of that top line revenue going back into R&D. So people are expected, are expected to, to, to try new things. And they can fail, and that's not a problem. So the perpetual business, we like to call this model the perpetual business, where people are the most important asset. Data is important to us as well, but people are the most important asset. We understand the difference between leadership and management, big difference. What's a leader? What's a manager? A manager is somebody who cares about a budget. A manager is somebody who has deadlines. A manager is somebody who has to keep their Gantt chart up to date. We need those people, but leaders are also important. Do we have leaders? Leaders are people who can understand the future. Leaders are those who, who have a vision. Leaders are those who can express the vision and motivate those around them. So you have to have a balance between leaders and managers. Strong relationships equal strong business. I talked about it, the importance of the employee-customer relationship. And the business must continue to evolve. And that's what this whole talk has been about, is that the business world has, is evolving at a rate that we have never, ever seen before and particularly in mature markets, we've got to do something about it. So I'll leave you with one last quote. I like this one a bunch. Um, it's not necessary to change. Survival's not mandatory, right? Great quote. You know, these people get really famous on this stuff. You know, probably drank too much wine in a bar and he said that and now he's famous for it. But you know, the, the reality is this is extremely true. So we, it, it, the choice is ours. No one's gonna tell us what to do. We have to get motivated, we have to understand the world around us, and then we gotta go out and get it. So that's the end of uh, my formal remarks. I'm happy to take any questions that any of you might have. Yes, sir. Where's the advice around the world most of your software development actually done? The question is, where is most of the software development done around the world? First and foremost is all the development is done by our employees. We don't, we don't outsource that to any other firms. The majority of development is done right here, here in Cary, North Carolina. What are we, 2,000? plus developers here in North Carolina. We have a development facility in Beijing. We have a development facility in India. We do do some development in a couple of spots um, in Europe. We have a development facility in Austin, Texas. Um, and we do some uh, localization, language localization in Tokyo. Um, but by far, uh, the majority of the development's done here. However, by the being employees, we don't just do testing and QA in these other locations. There's a lot of intellectual property in these other uh, R&D locations, and it's turned into a, a, a follow-the-sun R&D operation. So what you used to have was all the development done here in, in Cary, North Carolina, uh, and people would code all day, and they'd test, and they'd submit jobs, and they would come back the next morning to see the results. Now, uh, they don't have to do that. The coding is picked up, and the testing is picked up at some other part of the world, and the, and the product is, is, is evolving. Same model for tech support as well. Yes, sir. Are you looking at developing in India or China or Russia, like a lot of your competitors? Yeah, India has grown pretty uh, a lot. What do we got? Three hundred, around three hundred in India right now. China, China really represents. It's interesting. China is a more stable workforce right now. India has grown so quickly, and the average salary over there is increasing at fifteen percent a year. 
Um, everybody wants to be a manager. Um, it's not, I'm, I'm serious, you know, and, and good and good and good for them. But it, there's just so much money being thrown over there, and there's an infrastructure problem in India. The workers are still great, don't get me wrong, and the product is is excellent that comes out of India. But there are infrastructure issues. You go to Beijing, you got pretty good infrastructure. It's all brand new, and you got some people that are very very focused on what they're doing in Beijing. Beijing is what India was about 10 years ago. Um, we're not doing it much in Russia right now. We have, we have sales offices in Russia, so we have our own offices there. We look at places like Poland. There's a high, there's a, there's, you know, high per capita um, workforce there that really understands analytics um, in Poland for whatever reason. Um, so we're looking at expanding in that area. Yes, sir. Yep. Uh, the question is, uh, the, the way our license fee works to help answer this question is, let's say you pay us a hundred thousand dollars a year. The way the old model was, you paid us then, you then paid us a renewal of fifty percent of that for the rest of your life. So you pay us a hundred thousand dollars a year, and then make sure you write us a check for fifty thousand dollars, or your software will turn off. We have since moved that down to be about twenty-five to thirty percent, which is closer to a maintenance fee from a lot of other vendors. Um, so. We're doing a little bit better there. We've also, as we've gone into industry-focused solutions where the value proposition is much easier to quantify, um, it's much easier for people to justify the annual spend. The other thing that we've done recently is we're doing hosting. So people can buy on a subscription basis. Uh, actually, this fellow here, Armstead Sap, championed our, uh, uh, our SAS on de demand for academics. So a lot of university environments don't have to install the software. You can then uh, subscribe to it. Student can subscribe to it on a semester basis or an annual basis. We're also hosting some really large applications. I mentioned that financial institution in New York, um, Citibank, um, they, uh, uh, that's one of our largest customers and that's a hosted application at SAS of about 70 terabytes. We do marketing automation hosted. We do anti-money laundering for financial institutions hosted. So there's a big future um, in that activity. Uh, we do uh, drug development for pharmaceuticals in a hosted environment as well. Yes, sir. That was four, but I'll do all four. I got you. Um, Latin America is, believe it or not, you know, I mentioned that um, we're a global company. Latin America, we have our highest growth rate anywhere in the world in Latin America. It exceeds China, it exceeds India right now. I was in, um, uh, wh what is today? Tuesday? I was in uh, Brazil on Thursday and Friday, and I was in Chile on Tuesday and Wednesday last week. Just enormous, enormous markets for us. We've been down there for a while. Um, we're seeing somewhere around 50 to 60 percent growth rates in those markets. Brazil has softened just a little bit in the last few months. You know, during this whole stock market thing, they decided to shut down uh, for two, on two different days. A little bit better in Russia, they got concerned on Wednesday and they said, we're going sh to shut the market for, through the weekend, uh, which they did. So Brazil, Brazil's been a little bit shaky on the financial side, uh, but at the same time, the oil reserves there are unreal. So we do a lot of work in oil and gas as well, and that's a big market for us. Santiago, Chile, where I was, is really big in telecommunications and is really big in banking and retail now is pushing up in Santiago as well. Um, so I, I was very impressed with that. Um, your, other, your other question was um, Nokia. Uh, Nokia is a customer of ours as is most of the wireless carriers. They're also interesting um, as is Apple with the iPhone, as is uh, Blackberry with the RIM in terms of business intelligence and analytics and those being platforms for deployment of the presentation layer. Um, so we're doing a lot of work, uh, and actually Gail here is doing a lot of work on that at SAS. We've got a couple of SAS people here. She runs an R&D division that, that does a lot of our presentation layer work and is working on those devices right now. So that, that is very important to us as well. And, and those are, you know, the, the wireless market is changing dr dramatically. Salesforce, salesforce.com, interesting model. 
Um, they also now are moving more, everybody's trying to read, everybody's trying to define what cloud computing is. Um, that may be worse than analytics right now in terms of the term. But uh, Salesforce.com has a division called Force.com, which is a platform environment that we're looking at doing some business with uh, um, because we want to expand our hosting capability around the world and maybe even writing some applications to it. Salesforce is a pretty interesting model. It's an Oracle database under the covers with a bunch of user-defined fields. And, you know, Mark Benioff was pretty smart when he pushed that thing out, and, and, and people thought that it wouldn't last, um, and it seems to have some pretty good staying power. So, you know, I'm, I'm okay with it. Yes. <laughs> well, he did four. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, I was wondering if you could mention or comment on what the motivation for that was. And the second question is, what is your perception of having the Mr. Zimmer's group proceeding? Okay. Two questions. One is going public, and the other is a succession plan at SAS. Uh, the first on the, on the going pub public, that was pretty interesting. That was, um, that was something that was really started by the media. We were at a users group meeting. We were having a, um, a press conference, which we always do there. And it was right at the, hot of the, uh, the height of the dot-bomb revolution. And um, one of the guys in the back, I still remember who asked it. It was a guy by the name of Mike Schiff of a company called Current Analysis. He said, uh, Dr. Goodnight, um, what about uh, plans to share the wealth with the employees and give them a piece of the action? Because that's what it was all about. And he said, well, you know, maybe we need to do that. Maybe we should do that. And bam, we get back and Goldman Sachs is calling and, and, and <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it's going nuts. So we said, all right, let's look at this. We never really got serious, but we said, well, what would this be like? What sort of financial controls have to be in place? And then we started looking, and, and, and we, never, we never really got serious with it, but we developed relationships with the financial analysts that have proved beneficial in terms of promoting the value of our company versus um, our competitors. Uh, and there are no plans right now. There are no discussions to do that. We, we like where we are. As far as succession planning goes, we're like any other company out. First of all, uh, you, you can ask Jim Goodnight. He's, he's going to be around for another 80 years. But, <laughs> but um, it, truth be told, we're like any other company. You know, do, do we have a good management team in place? We have a very good management team in place. Do we know what to do? Should we have to deal with something at some point in the future? Absolutely. But we are like every other company. We're not going to sit here and, and show a slide deck of, should this happen on this date, this is what it would look like. Uh, but rest assured, um, SAS will not disappear. Um, I, it, even if we tried to make it disappear, I don't think we could. Thank you very much. Yeah, thanks. Thank you.